Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. David Jordan. I'm one of the co-directors of the Freeman Air and Space Institute here at King's, and I'm a member of the Defence Studies Department, um, which operates out of the now Joint Services Command and Staff College at Shrivenham. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, be with you today with uh, Helen Parr, uh, Professor Helen Parr, who will be uh, talking um, about her work relating to, to para, and if uh, Major General Chip Chapman manages to get his Zoom connection back and working, um, we will uh, hear his thoughts of his experiences with Two Para uh, during Operation Corpus. Um, the timing um, for this panel, uh, James has kindly set it up so um, you get to hear a limited amount from me to begin with before the more interesting uh, element, which will be Helen, and then, as I say, be back with us, Chip. Um, my role really is to talk about the air element, and I'll give you a few moments there, if I may. One of the problems, I think, that we see with the air element of corporate is that the historiography, the history, isn't necessarily that clear, because a lot of the files uh, were classified until 2012. And I think um, one of my former PhD students, Group Captain John Shields, um, who's written an excellent book on the air war in the Falklands based on his PhD, may be on the call with us uh, now. So there's a risk of me having my homework seriously marked here. But I think our previous speakers raised a number of interesting points relating to the lack of joint training and the lack of trust. If we go back to the 1960s, um, something called the Templar uh, Committee, which was on the organization of future air services, it concluded um, in one of sort of the great understatements and great casually phrased um, conclusions for any report I've seen that the arrangements for air services in the United King Kingdom were, quote, pretty much right, unquote, and that they were likely to remain so for quite some time. But the period of the 1960s was marked by um, bitter interdepartmental warfare, particularly between the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy, to the extent that the Templar, uh, Templar reports also concluded the state of relations between uh, the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force was, quote, deplorable, at least at senior levels. And I think that some of the mistrust that arose during that period, where you see the whole dis uh, dispute over what's known as the island strategy, a lot of which is misrepresented. Um, for instance, the claim the Royal Air Force moves Australia a thousand miles to kill off the carrier. As far as any historians I'm aware of have encountered, the movement of a thousand miles of Australia did take place, but in a typographical error made by the chief scientific advisor, who in a report, stated that Australia was in the Atlantic Ocean. And I think that may well be where the, um, a, a large amount of the misunderstanding comes from. There, there is a, other evidence that need to detain, need to detain us now, but the, the point is there's great mistrust. And that filters through to some of our understanding of what went on in 1982 in terms of air power. There is a dangerous tendency when we talk about air power to try to stovepipe the term so that it really applies only to air forces. And of course, as we saw in the Operation Corporate, the majority of the air power that was involved in contact with the Argentines was, of course, overwhelmingly from the fleet air arm, supported by some exchange pilots from uh, the Royal Air Force's Harrier GR3 force, and indeed elements of number one fighter squadron who flew down with uh, modified Harrier GR3s led by the then wing commander, Peter Squire, um, their commanding officer, ultimately, of course, the uh, chief of the air staff, sadly no longer with us. But the majority of our discussion seems to me to be predicated around two things. First, the role of the Sea Harrier, well, quite rightly, receives a lot of attention. And from the air side, we also spend a lot of time talking about the merits or other rise of what's known as Operation Black Buck, which, of course, most, if not all of you on the call will be aware of, is the raids by um, 
Vulcan bombers against the airfield of Port Stanley. It seems that a lot of the coverage deals with just the first raid, which occurred on the 1st of May, 1982, um, placing a single thousand pound bomb into the runway and ignores some of the other operations. And it also seems to be portrayed as um, a quote in Hugh Man Manis's book, um, one of the participants described this as a desperate bid by the Royal Air Force to get involved in the war. Um, I'll briefly uh, challenge that view about a bid to get involved a little later, but I think we need to understand that the driving factor behind Operation Black Buck comes very clearly out of the files, that in fact the Chief of the Air Staff of the day, the late uh, Sir Michael Beaton, Sir Michael spends quite some time trying to convince his fellow Chiefs of Staff and Admiral Fieldhouse that the best platform to attack the runway is in fact the Sea Harrier because of the fact it's a much better um, avionics kit than the Vulcan, which of course was designed in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and he's using equipment that is not entirely unfamiliar to Sir Michael Beaton from his days as a Lancaster pilot in the Second World War. But Admiral Leach, in particular, makes the point that there are only 20 or so Sea Harriers available and that it is vital to conserve them for the landing operations commanded by Commodore Clapp and Major General Thompson, of course. And what we see, therefore, is the Royal Air Force arguing briefly for the employment of a fleet air arm aircraft to do the job, and the Royal Navy arguing for the employment of a Royal Air Force aircraft to do the job. And the Royal Navy's arguments hold sway. Stanley is identified, the airfield with Stanley is identified as being a major or potential obstacle to British operations, which therefore must be attacked. And the files are quite clear on this. The debate goes on. Do you attack it using members of special forces? Do you try to get ships in to bombard the airfield with naval gunfire support? Um, or should you attack it from the air? And if you do, should you use Sea Harrier or Vulcan? The other options are discounted. And for the reasons I've just alluded to, the Vulcan is selected. This requires an enormous feat of airmanship from not only the Vulcan crews to get the aircraft over the target, but also the Victor tanker crews who are supporting them. And the strike of one bomb on the runway, in some ways, comes as a very pleasant surprise because their Chief Marshal Beatham had informed his fellow Chiefs of Staff that he would like, if they wished him to close the runway, he would require at least 25 sorties to do this and he would prefer 50 to guarantee getting sufficient ordnance into the runway to do this. The problem is that a lot of that debate is lost in some of the um, it's going to sound terribly snobbish here, but more populist coverage, the sort of coverage that concentrates on the fact that the Vulcan was a very impressive airframe, um, and coverage which also doesn't look at the context in which the whole Black Buck operation, um, of which of course there's seven sorties, two abort, sort of in which they, those are conducted. A lot of the narrative after the, after the war doesn't quite understand what's going on there. Uh, and the fact that this is actually a very good piece of joint thinking in, all, in many ways by the Chiefs of Staff. Although Field Marshal Bramall, the CGS, doesn't have a huge amount of input uh, into the discussion, you can see from uh, the contemporaneous record that, he, that he's supportive of this idea, that the idea is that you must strike against the airfield because of the fact that it potentially creates all sorts of difficulties for the task force. One point to be borne in mind, of course, is that the Chiefs of Staff are looking at this in terms of how would we make use of Port Stanley were we the Argentines? And their almost immediate conclusion, in fact, a conclusion they're reaching almost before the first Argentine um, Marine has set foot on the Falkland Islands, when it becomes clear that an invasion is about to take place, almost the first thing they think about is, well, obviously, we would extend the runway to make it much more viable as a forward operating location for our fast jet force. The Argentinian junta, of course, has not thought of it in that way. So in some ways, 
our decision for that element of the air war is driven by considerations of British common sense planning. And I think that's a very valuable point as our previous speakers have brought out that a lot of what we com um, make complex through fancy words is in fact common sense. Um, and just finding a more complicated way of obscuring the fact that it is common sense. But the whole approach with Black Black, as I say, dominates the war in terms of the way people write about this. I'd also suggest, though, that this is where the challenge in terms of the um, idea that the Air Force is desperate to get in on the act. Well, the Air Force is in on the act from the 31st of March, 1982 when it becomes clear that there is something going on in the South Atlantic, some Her a Hercules at Lynham is loaded with equipment initially to be flown out to Gibraltar. And then as it arrives in the Argentinian uh, start of the invasion, they in fact night stop in Gibraltar and take the equipment down uh, to Ascension Island for loading onto the Royal Fleet Auxiliary RFA Fort Austin. And the transport force sets up an air bridge running out of uh, most notably um, Gambia uh, and Senegal, uh, Banjul and, and Dakar. And this again highlights some of the other elements, which now we would call multi-domain integration, but in 1982, I suspect we probably called sensible diplomacy, which involved making sure that the governments of Senegal and Gambia are content to allow us to operate uh, air, uh, aircraft, most notably the Hercules and the VC-10, but also some chartered aircraft, making sure that we're content to operate them. So um, we can operate them and they're content for this to happen. We see, of course, a very significant change to the air transport fleet or much of the air transport fleet and then realization that the tyranny of distance, the distance that makes the Falklands a viable own, uh, maritime only operation, um, supported by air because of the importance of, as Admiral Parry suggested, the, um, the fact that we're talking about retaking islands. The distance means that air-to-air -air refueling is required. And initially, the Hercules lose some of their cargo bay to additional fuel tank. And a very impressive and very quick um, piece of improvisation, drawing upon uh, spare refueling probes taken off the um, Vulcan fleet that's been, or the elements of the Vulcan fleet that have been retired, that is introduced in a matter of three weeks, a whole trial fit and tested. And some of the Hercules crews um, find themselves conducting 24 hour long sorties, including air to air refueling, to the point that crew fatigue becomes a concern. And the Air Force has to trawl through a number of flying training schools and various ground jobs to bring Hercules air crew back to RAF Lynham, then the operating base for Hercules to ensure that sufficient crew are available to avoid the risk of fatigue leading to accidents. The VC-10 force is also extremely heavily involved. And we do see some charter operations as well. Former Royal Air Force Belfast retired in the 1975 um, defense review. They have to be chartered back for a few flights. And we also see the use of some commercial um, freighters. But it does raise, I think, a notable question about logistics and the way in which we use air mobility to ensure that operations are supported. And if one were to bring that to the modern era, one could raise questions as to whether the air mobility force is big enough. Um, notably, of course, the forthcoming retirement of the C-130s uh, in the next 12 to 18 months. And the other angle, the other aspect of the air war that gets omitted is, of course, the use of helicopter operations. One helicopter in particular, and understandably, given all the achievements of its crew, um, gets all the attention it seems, and that is the Chinook Bravo November, recently um, retired to an honoured display position at the RAF Museum Cosford, uh, which I believe well, I'm now supposed to call the RAF Museum Midlands, um, but that gets all the coverage. Indeed, a, uh, some of you may have seen a programme done by the journalist, the automotive journalist, Mike Brewer, where he covered the history of the Chinook and notably Bravo November on TV. This ignores the fact that the fleet air arm and commando helicopter force 
operates very, very extensively um, with its rotary wing fleet, somewhere in the re of around a dozen uh, fleet air arm and army air corps helicopters are lost um, operationally. Uh, that doesn't include those that are sunk aboard the Atlantic conveyor or which are lost when um, various vessels are sunk as a result of Argentine air attack. And they are the vital and unsung element of operations that takes place. Admiral Parry was too modest to mention his rather crucial role in the sinking of the Santa Fe um, at South Georgia. And I think there's another area that is ripe for research, which is looking at the forgotten areas of the air war, as well as place, um, as well as the uh, more placing of them into context, not leaving um, the aforementioned friend of mine, John Shields, alone in, in carrying the banner for looking what air contributed. The final thing I think I should say is to talk about maritime patrol operations and some of the lessons there. We have to remember that the Falklands does not take place in a vacuum. The Cold War is a major concern, and of course it's one of the justifications, whether or not one agrees with it or not, is a separate issue, but it's one of the justifications that Sir John Knott used for the 1981 review, which was that he had to focus upon Europe. Now, that meant, of course, the threat presented by the Soviet Union. And the Maritime Patrol Force was very heavily tasked. So elements of that force, again, with probes being air to every fuel probes being fitted to um, aircraft, notably to the uh, reconnaissance Nimrods, those aircraft play an important part, um, <coughs> excuse me, play, play an important part in delivering the effect um, in terms of looking at maritime aviation information, but there is a problem. And the problem there is that the Nimrod Mark II, recently brought into service, is chosen as the platform of choice, or the aircraft of choice, to avoid the jargon, to conduct those maritime patrol operations. But the search water radar doesn't work as well as everybody anticipated, which leads to some information being transmitted to Admiral Woodward, which is not quite as he expected, or which lacks detail, or which requires a bit more speculative interpretation than anticipated. So that is another area that we need to think about. How do we make sure that the capabilities that we require are available when needed? Because the Nimrod force had to deal with a whole host of challenges, including a variety of urgent operational requirements that saw the aircraft being fitted with Sidewinder missiles and the Harpoon anti-ship missile, as well as the ability to deliver unguided ordnance in an anti-shipping role, a thousand pound free fall bombs. Now, one of the human aspects of this, I think I may have just seen it pop up, is the fact that when we talk about generating air power in the Falklands campaign, we need to bear in mind that it's not just those who fly the aircraft, but it's actually those who maintain them. Yeah, the maintainers aboard Hermes have a further complication imposed upon them, as well as more aircraft than they're normally used to operating with. They are asked to cover a whole host of operations and on top of that, they have to deal with the Harrier GR3s from number one squadron, which although they're Harriers, they're not quite the same thing. And for various reasons, not least in terms of the number of berths available aboard the vessels, number one squadron is effectively forbidden to send as many engineers to support the Harrier GR3s as they would like. That means that the fleet air arm maintainers aboard Hermes are working extremely hard to support their RAF colleagues, while their RAF colleagues, when they can, are working extremely hard to try to support their Royal Naval colleagues, realizing that the Harrier and the Sea Harrier are slightly different. And um, one story there, just to illustrate that point, if I may, I suppose, is the case of Flight Lieutenant John Leeming. Um, Flight Lieutenant Leeming um, had previously been a Lightning pilot. Um, sadly, he's, um, he was killed in a mid-air collision in 1984. But John Leeming had been a lightning pilot and because of the desire to increase the number of pilots available to the task force, the Har RAF Harrier Force was trawled for uh, pilots with air defense experience. And John Leeming um, had been a lightning pilot, volunteers to go down to the South Atlantic. And he engages Argentine aircraft, almost, or, or almost his first sorting. And when he's firing the 30 millimeter cannon, 
them, he discovers that he's missing any solution to this. He's getting incredibly close. He almost manages to blow up an Argentine air himself, as well as the Argentine aircraft that he strikes with the cannon fire. And it turns out that the gun sight is calibrated slightly differently on a Sea Harrier compared to a Harrier. And because of his rushed conversion to the Sea Harrier, this was a rather vital piece of information that had been missed. But that, I think, is also illustrative of the fact there are some challenges for the maintainers to have to deal with. So when we look at air power in the forefront, I think, first of all, we need to see this holistically. We need, of course, to give due credit to the, to the majority force that is down there, the fleet air arm. We need to recognise, and as yet we have not done so adequately, I'd suggest, the role played by the rotary wing elements there, the Wessex, the Seeking, the Lynx. We need also to bear in mind that the major focus of much of the Royal Air Force um, historiography, that's historiography about the Royal Air Force rather than generated by it, concentrates on Operation Black Buck for good reasons that I hope I've outlined. But in fact, it often misses the context of where Black Buck sits. It is good, strong, joint, higher level thinking by Admirals Lewin, Leach, Fieldhouse, Air Chief Marshal Beatham, um, and as I say, um, Field, Mar Field Marshal Bramall. And Admiral Woodward is also supportive as the idea, as he made clear at the Falklands Witness Seminar held at Shrivenham uh, 20 years ago um, this year. And the other factor is that human factor, which as I say, is that air power cannot be generated easily if you don't have sufficient maintainers to do this. And those maintainers, particularly maintaining all the confines of an aircraft carrier, their air, that understanding of how air power is generated is missing from a lot of our understanding. And finally, our understanding of an aspect that doesn't excite the attention of the media very often, that of air mobility, air transport, the vital logistic as aspects that air power contributes to, that is something that is also missing from our considerations. And I think I'll, I'll leave that there, having hopefully offered a few um, insights related to the aspects of air power um, as they pertain to the Falklands, and then uh, hand over, if I may, to Helen um, to, hear, to hear her thoughts um, relating to uh, the land campaign and to Parrot. Thank you. Helen, over to you. Gosh, thank you, David. That was uh, um, uh, extremely interesting. Um, so I think my contribution is perhaps a little bit different in that I'm talking sort of more broadly about the relationship between uh, army and society and the experiences uh, of some members of the parachute regiment during the uh, campaign in the Falklands. Uh, and that's based on the research I did for uh, my book, um, Our Boys, The Story of a Paratrooper. So that starts with, well, when I was seven years old, um, my uncle, my father's youngest brother, Private Dave Parr of the 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, was killed at Wireless Ridge in the final hours of the Falklands War. I remember very clearly hearing the news of his death, and I remember very clearly his funeral six months later. His coffin on a gun carriage was pulled slowly through the streets of Alton Broad, the Suffolk town where he had grown up. I always wanted to uh, write a book about the Falklands War, but I think it's fair to say I didn't know quite what that book would be. I began the research uh, for the book I wrote in 2012, uh, around about the time of the 30th anniversary, and I went with my father to Aldershot Military Cemetery uh, for the 30th anniversary commemorations of the conflict. We hadn't really been in touch with the Parachute Regiment since 1983, and uh, the story that I'd grown up with was one of loss, of seeing the effects of my uncle's death on my grandparents, particularly on his mother, my grandmother. So I began the research by talking to people, uh, firstly to uh, Major Philip Neen, the officer commanding D Company 2 Power, the company that uh, my uncle had been in, and then to many others who had served with him and in other companies and battalions of them, and also in 3 Power. And as soon as I started talking to people, I could see that the story that I'd grown up with was um, only a partial one. 
I could see that if I wanted to understand the parachute regiment in the Falklands War, even a little bit, then I had to try to understand things from the perspective of paratroopers. And that perspective was un entirely unfamiliar to me. Uh, and only then could I attempt to write the, the book that I eventually wrote. So to conduct the research, I, I spoke to people, soldiers of uh, most ranks and also to family members of soldiers who'd been killed. And I tried to understand what it was that they wanted to tell me. But I also uh, put the interviews into fuller contexts, uh, both social and military. I did a lot of archival research, particularly in the parachute regiment archives at the Airborne Assault Museum in Duxford. And by doing that, I hope I was able to place people's stories and recollections within histories that were accurate and that made sense to them as well as to me. So what I want to highlight is uh, three main themes uh, about the experiences of the Parachute Regiment and the, the Falklands conflict. The first theme is the relationship between army and society, broadly speaking. In a sense, the Falklands conflict stood at a bridge, bridging point between the period defined by the Second World War and conscription and the more contemporary period that we're familiar with now. In 1982, the memory of the Second World War was still proximate. Men joined up in this period, partly because it was, for many families, an expected thing to do. Even in families where there wasn't a history of voluntary military service, boys often dreamed of becoming soldiers, uh, as I'm sure my uncle did. And it was possible to establish from the, the records that this was really just before the period in which unemployment began to influence recruitment in a much more obvious way. So the generation who went to the Falklands, um, I don't think they were joining up because they couldn't find jobs. They were usually joining up because they didn't want the jobs that they could otherwise get. Most boys had done poorly at school, but I'm talking about men who are entering the ranks of the parachute regiment, obviously. And they joined because they didn't want the jobs other men in their neighborhoods did. They didn't want to go down the pit. They didn't want to work in a factory. They wanted adventure. In the 1950s, army advertising campaigns had focused on the fact that military service was a steady job with guaranteed housing. But by the late 1970s, it emphasized instead pictures of overseas beaches, water skiing, young women in bikinis. This was also a time in which the concept of teenager was still being invented. Some people, I think, were joining up because they were reacting against that counterculture. But in another sense, I think it perhaps influenced people in ways that were slightly uh, less obvious. It was a time when young people were supposed to be expanding their horizons. So, of course, some boys had grown up in very deprived circumstances. Histories of uh, childhood spent in children's homes or experiencing domestic violence did seem to be comparatively common amongst people who I spoke to and also anecdotally from other sources. Some people were running away from something worse. But I think that for most, they joined because they wanted more from, from, their, to the, from their lives. They wanted to make something of themselves. As one man who I interviewed, who'd grown up in a mining area said, you could go home in uniform, show your mates. It was brilliant. So the second theme to emphasize concerns the making of a military masculine identity and the training that led boys to become paratroopers. Training was transformative. The making of a paratrooper in training was indistinguishable from the making of a man. Michael Asher, paratrooper Michael Asher in his memoir said, for me, it was the symbol of passing from childhood to manhood. Money could not buy this. No friends, connections or privileges of birth could attain it. The recruit trainers who ran um, the, the training programme knew what they were looking for. A willingness to put the collective good of the regiment ahead of the needs of the individual. And they also, perhaps particularly in this period, believed in character or moral fibre. They were looking for recruits who could separate their domestic lives from their army careers and who, in shorthand, were man enough for the job. Just to give you a, a, a flavour of this, uh, I was able to look through some of the uh, record cards of, um, of the, uh, uh, that were, that were uh, maintained by the lieutenant in charge of recruit training at Depot Para. Um, 
And um, on the front of the cards, they, they put quite rudimentary information, you know, where the boy's from, uh, the age he was at, the, the, the marks in the sum selection tests. But on the back of the cards, uh, they could write um, their, either, sometimes they wrote their first impression. Well, many of you may know this because you might have actually done it, but um, some of them would write their first impressions of the, um, uh, of, of the, the new recruit in front of them. And particularly, they often uh, made comments about the recruits if they didn't make it through training. Um, on the card of, and sort of through looking at those comments, I think the sort of that connection between manhood and passing training was, was, was really evident. On the card of one man who did not pass training, the lieutenant wrote, rather wet and pathetic individual with no moral values, no mental stamina, no physical ability, using a groin strain as an excuse for not taking P company, yet he still managed to impregnate his girlfriend. Yuck, not recommended for re-enlistment. So the process of passing training gave the recruits a powerful and collective loyalty to their regiment. Uh, Martin Margerison said, they put a flying horse in my head and it's still flying around to this day. The loyalty that in, it instilled, I think had a moral core, that moral fiber or character, but it was also aggressive. If it came to it, they had to be prepared to value the reputation of the regiment more highly than their lives. But at least in the ranks, they had a strong sense that they were the men who could be called upon in extremes to do what other units or other men could not withstand. And it was through this lens, the lens of the regiment, that they talked about the experiences of the battles that they fought in the Falklands. So obviously the experiences that people had were varied, the experiences related to, um, to what they were asked to do, the experiences related to the, the specific positions they, um, they found themselves in. Not everybody experienced it in the same way. Um, I, I want to emphasize that, but then I also want to sort of to pick up on, on some of the sort of the common ways in which uh, people reflected upon the experiences subsequently. So they had courage. They wanted to be tested. They wanted to see if they could match up to the high standards of paratroopers past. They knew going, to the islands that the Argentines were a conscript army and that they, the parachute regiment, were professionals. They were the best. They were young. They thought they were invincible. Uh, one man explained to me, the beret makes you bulletproof. The beret, the holy grail from training. They didn't believe that death could happen to them. Uh, it could only happen to other people. On the start lines, Private Worrell recalled that he felt terrific. I always wanted to kill. I always wanted to be a soldier. However, when the, the, the fighting started, sometimes the experience was not exactly as they had expected. Corporal Martin Margerison said, I shot that first sentry coming off the start lines up the hill, and that's a terrible thing to do. Not the fact that I killed him, but that it was up to me whether he should die or not. It wasn't like a John Wayne movie. He didn't get blown back five or 10 yards. He just collapsed like a bag of jelly. And I think there's something there. Uh, I think you can see a, a sense of his responsibility according to his rank. It was up to me whether he should die or not. But also there's a kind of emptiness in the way in which he recounted it. He'd done the right thing. He'd taken the decision to shoot. He'd probably saved the lives of his men. But talking about it later, it could be hard to recapture exactly that moment, hard to recapture exactly how right he had been. Another corporal recalled firing at the schoolhouse at Goose Green um, during the, the daytime uh, during that battle. He said, I was one of the guys who fired a 66 into the schoolhouse. And you know the film Rambo, when he fires into a cave, there's a big explosion. And that's what we were expecting. But there was no woohoo moment as such. So again, there's no resolution. They wanted the opportunity to kill. But when it happened, men died, but nothing stopped. They had to keep going. And sometimes if they saw their comrades killed or if they were the, themselves injured, it could be tough. One said, one lieutenant said, it was the first time most of us had come under fire at close range. And obviously the deaths of two in such an apparently random manner brought home the seriousness of the situation. It might sound rather naive to say so, 
but up until then we were quite gung-ho and confident death would only happen to somebody else. When Corporal Margerison was injured, he was shot in the shoulder and jaw. He said he didn't feel sorry for himself. He said he felt disgusted, and that was the word that he used, that he had been caught out. He felt disgusted with himself that he had, as he saw it, left his men on the ground. He could no longer play his part in the regiment he loved. And it could be hard also sometimes to explain the destructiveness of chance, the reasons why sometimes one man was shot, but another right next to him was unhurt. And for some, perhaps a, a small number is very hard to, to, to put figures on this. When they look back on it later, they could feel almost a sense of shame that they had not been good enough as they saw it to save their comrades. One man said, we thought we were the greatest fighters. We were a bit shattered when it actually happened. And there's a paradox there, isn't there? They won, they matched the test that they'd been set, but even then it could still sometimes be difficult. So the final theme to emphasize is uh, what happens in the aftermath of the Falklands conflict. So in many ways, the conflict marked a turning point, perhaps a different turning point to, to the ways in which it was perceived at the time. The lasting change in practices of memorialization was that the British government permitted repatriation of bodies of those who'd fallen on land for families who wished it. That decision I don't think was anticipated at the start of the conflict. It came about partly uh, because some families requested it, but it was apparent from uh, the records in the National Archives that it was mainly because of a campaign in the tabloid press. Um, after the conflict, when TV footage was broadcast from the islands, um, um, some footage was shown of the temporary burial of paratroopers after the Battle of Goose Green, and that led some people who'd seen it to think that that, that was the, the final resting place, and they wrote uh, to, um, to, to say that, that it wasn't good enough. The agreement to repatriate was authorised by Mrs Thatcher, who I think um, genuinely wanted to alleviate the pain that families felt but who was also alive to the possibility that stories of family suffering could take the edge off uh, Britain's victory. Repatriation was also feasible. Of the 255 British deaths, 174 had been at sea and their bodies could not be recovered. Officials who were um, assessing the, the, the possibility of repatriation did ask themselves whether uh, the practice could create divisions between the services, but they concluded that Although the bodies lost at sea could not be recovered, the families already knew the locations of the deaths. There was nobody in that horrible no man's land, so common during the world wars, of missing presumed dead. Repatriation took six months to organise and eventually 64 bodies were brought home. Uh, most, as my uncle was, were laid to rest in local civilian churchyards uh, with full military honours. Repatriation therefore brought military symbolism into Britain's street. It was not yet the outpouring of emotion associated with wooden basses uh, during Iraq and Afghanistan, because this was 1982, and to line the streets at a funeral or when a hearse passed by, I think was still customary. But it did draw attention to the feelings of what came to be called military families. And it marked what we can see now the, as, as the inception of a change in British attitudes towards its soldiers. In a break with past traditions, soldiers were no longer seen simply as military men uh, laid to rest where they fell with their comrades in the service of their country. But they came over time to be seen as individual men who'd chosen the military path and they were men with families who loved them. And over time, perhaps uh, we can think that that attitudinal shift contributed to to produce a more sentimental British attitude towards the armed services, evident during the conflicts in Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan, as people then expressed favour for the armed services, even if they did not support the government or the campaign. So that is that concludes my uh, short presentation. Thank you, Helen. Sorry, my, my mute button decided to misbehave there. 
Um, I'm afraid it appears that uh, General <coughs> Chip may have been defeated by his internet connection. Um, and we won't, unfortunately, be able to hear from him uh, as a result of that. What I'd propose to do, if I may, is to have a sort of a brief period of um, discussion and to handle any questions that, um, that come in via the uh, Q&A button or the chat um, with Helen. And I may, um, if I can be so bold, possibly um, bring in a couple of our earlier speakers in, uh, for, for, a, for one question that does appear to arise. And then we will move over to um, the to panel three a little earlier than anticipated. Um, but thank you, Helen. That was a very interesting and, um, uh, and a fascinating um, introduction to your um, to your research. And of course, I think it's I think it's worth pointing out that we we should also uh, I think use the you know, use the phrase sort of um, you know, phrases like um, you know, uh, award winning. Um, because it is a truly fascinating insight into uh, the development of the, of, of the parachute regiment in particular. But I think there's some wider lessons, if I may. And I noticed that in the chat, um, Tom Navin, um, he, he remarks on the, um, his feelings about treatment received from um, the Ministry of Defence and, uh, and, in his case, the Army. And I was wondering if I might ask, just broadening this out, particularly as you were talking about the funerals, whether you had any thoughts on the way in which the veteran uh, community from 1982 was treated, I'm thinking of some of the uh, some of the comments that Hugh McMahon has made in his uh, Scars of War uh, book relating to some of the PTSD issues. I just wondered if you had any any thoughts or feelings from your research um, on the aspects of sort of the post-war treatment of those who, those, those who survived and came back and lived with the memories of, of the fighting. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, please. Uh, yeah, sure. It is a um, it's a very good question, and I'm I'm interested to see Tom Navin's comment in the uh, in the chat there as well on being treated terribly on return by the army and the MOD. Um, I think there's many things that can be said. Um, so I think you mentioned uh, just then specifically uh, PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. I think um, in 1982, I think it's important to recall the um, mood of the period. So the, the term PTSD had only entered the World Psychiatric Manual in 1980, and then it had entered it as a response to the American experiences in Vietnam. And I think there was a, a, a presumption amongst um, the armed services, but perhaps in some ways not unreasonably, that, um, that the that the experiences of American conscripts were going to be very different to the experiences of, uh, of professionally trained British soldiers. And that therefore this sort of informed a general assumption that on return from the Falklands that the incidences of psychological trauma were going to be very low. So in 1982, I think the possibility that men could be coming back uh, with um, with PTSD or any condition similar to PTSD uh, was it's not really there in 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 public or in military consciousness and that obviously makes it extremely difficult for anybody who returns home and is exhibiting those kinds of uh, uh, those kinds of symptoms i think that attitude only really begins to shift in the late 1980s so um uh, in the late 1980s, there was a study done by um, actually by Stephen Hughes, who'd been two powers doctor during the uh, during the conflict, where he drew attention to relatively high amounts of, um, of, 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 of veterans who were exhibiting signs of trauma, perhaps even as, as many as a third of people who'd been in sort of in um, in close quarters combat. So from the late 1980s, I think military attitudes are beginning to be challenged. And then from about the same period, uh, one begins to, to find 
um, more public examples of uh, of people coming forward to talk about um, to talk about trauma. So Simon Weston is probably the first one, probably the first, and still probably the the best known. Uh, but then from the early nineteen nineties, there's there's other memoirs, other parish, uh, including some parachute mem regiment memoirs published that begin to draw sort of greater public attention to uh, the phenomenon of, of PTSD. And I think it's in in uh, the fifteenth. Uh, year anniversary of the conflict when the armed services sort of directly talk about the sort of psychological legacy of uh, of, of combat so there's a there's a huge shift takes place but it doesn't really begin to take hold probably to the mid uh, to late 1990s so that's one aspect of um of the response to your question second aspect is uh, thinking about the sort of the the formal um memorialization so there was um, there was a, a, a sort of a, a military parade held uh, in the city of London. And um, one, in the initial planning of the military parade, the, the notion that disabled veterans could form part of the, the parade wasn't even considered. And again, I think that this is a sort of, this is a reflection of, of um, uh, of the time, it's something, and it's a sort of it's an, it's another indication in some ways of how far away 1982 is from from the contemporary period. I mean, the idea now that you would just overlook uh, veterans who'd lost limbs, for example, is 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 unthinkable. But in the initial planning for the for the victory parade, I think it, it wasn't given consideration, and then then there was sort of then there was pushback from from veterans. Uh, it was raised in the House of Commons and in the um, in in the victory parade that, that took place the provision was made for some uh, disabled veterans to um to to take part so again i think there's there's a, there's a sort of there's a huge generational shift taking place there um there was i think it was it was very difficult for uh, veterans or who returned injured to access medical support sometimes it was very difficult um for families uh, sometimes even to do basic things like visit them uh, in military hospitals to provide uh, bandages and so forth. Um, those are things that I just remember being kind of highlighted in some of the press reports. And I think, again, there was a sort of uh, one of the things that uh, was um, in the National Archives was when um, medals were sent out to families of deceased servicemen, they were sent out in jiffy bags with self-assembly instructions. And that was the MOD were following protocol. But again, probably partly because of the sort of the, the, the changed circumstances of the time, uh, the changed sort of way in which uh, attention could be given to, to, to military families. Uh, that also sort of caused an outcry um, with the, the, you know, the lack of respect kind of being shown to individual service uh, service families. So I hope that goes some way to answering your uh, your question. I don't know if we want to hear more from um, from Tom. Yes, I mean, to, Tom, please feel free to, um, Tom says, anyone exhibiting PTSD, um, the posted out or even discharged from service without support and, medal and medals arrived in a box in pieces, as you just alluded to. The, um, their uh, hell and I think that's you know so that which reinforces reinforces your point um, and I wonder and I don't know whether um, General Julian or whether um, Commodore Crapp indeed have any thoughts on this as well as I see they're still on the call um, but it, it strikes me could, would it be fair to say that this is a willful um, lack of um, compassion but as you say it's protocol and process um, which presumably would have been through just through the sheer scale of the first and then the second world wars, making that the human touch, if you will, making that almost impossible. Um, wasn't the 1982 MOD hadn't thought about this in any sufficient detail? Um, and, and it's process, do you think? I think that is probably the case. Um, and um, so I think in some ways that that's, that's one of the ways in which we can see that the Falklands conflict kind of sits on this sort of social turning point in a way. And it is quite interesting that the, the 
the tabloid press, you know, in a sense, is also quite a player because the Falklands um, relatives of, of personnel who were experiencing difficulties, their stories were, were picked up in the tabloid press and therefore sort of received greater coverage than perhaps they would have done in, a, in, an, in an earlier period. And that obviously then creates sort of a political pressure and leads to a, a, a sort of a, an, an attempt to kind of to, to, to change the protocol, to change the process, to respond sort of more obviously to, um, to, to families' uh, needs or, or requirements. Um, I think it probably also is moving from a period in which, you know, as you just said, sort of in World War II, that kind of personalised experience wasn't possible and perhaps people didn't expect it. Moving into a, in, into a period where, although, you know, the numbers during the Falklands conflict are, are high for a short space of time, they're still small enough to to warrant that kind of ind individual individual attention uh, so i think it kind of it, it begins to prompt reconsideration of of um of those relationships between army and society and of how they play out in the public domain okay thank you um i know our chair james has a question that he'd like to ask as well but just before we move to james i wonder if um commodore quap or um major general thompson whether you have any thoughts on any of those issues relating to the way in which um, veterans were handled or some of the experiences that you might have had um, f uh, in dealing with veterans um, of the conflict under your command who perhaps exhibited signs of some sort of trauma. Um, whether you have any thoughts on that, I, I don't know, but if you do, I, I think we'd be grateful, grateful to hear them. Um, as far as the Navy was concerned, it was very difficult to find a trauma like that. Um, because you're, um, I don't, I don't remember meeting anybody who was showing obvious effects by it, particularly. But I'm sure they were around, because uh, I think mostly the the ones that were were ones that had been on a ship that had got bombed or something. But um, of course, they disappear back home as, as fast as they can go. So they weren't actually coming to meet people like me and I couldn't get to see them in time. Yes, thank you. I think, I, I think as well, but perhaps a, um, a difference between the services and a difference between experience or so that commonality of experience between the services, of course, would differ. Um, just before I go to um, James, um, General Julian, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to add or um, shall I move on to James? I'm not sure if General Julian can hear me, so I'll hand over James over to you, please, with your thought or question. I, I thought I'd uh, ask you a question because there wasn't one for you, David. So, um, talking logistics, so I mean something that today, because we live in a society which always seems, you know, next day delivery, we forget it's ridiculously difficult to get a pallet from, you know, England all the way down to eight thousand miles away to the Falkland Islands. Um, and something that's obviously been picked up, and I think resonates with today. Um, how this was a completely almost isolated environment where um, nothing could really be leaked too much apart from maybe the, the, the press who had gone down with the Falklands Task Force versus we've seen in Ukraine, you know, 20 seconds after something happens, there's a tweet and a photo, um, which I suspect will be very useful in the long run for, for obvious reasons. But sort of looking at the RAF then, um, a lot of emphasis is put on uh, what historians have called the decline and fall of the Royal Navy, which is something I, I hate as a term being used, it becoming this North Atlantic service. The RAF also was, was going through fairly reasonable cuts to some degree, wasn't it, because its mission was. Um, by then, the nuclear deterrence mission was going, etc., and all that type of thing are gone. And it was essentially tied to what was that continental commitment. So how... How did the Falklands impact the RAF sort of in that 80s and 90s period? And then has it had any impact in this, this longer period since? That's a very good question. And I think the, I think the honest answer is it's not entirely clear. The, in the aftermath of the war, there was some talk, and Andrew Dorman has covered this um, in his book, Defence Under, Under Thatcher. He's spoken to some former senior Royal Air Force officers at the time, 
who said that there was discussion as to whether the fact that you could, and this of course is something the United States looked at, whether the, um, to use a buzzword, the synergy, um, buzzword end, buzzword transmission ends, um, between long range aircraft and carrier based aircraft and maritime forces, whether that was something that, that could be exploited. And did this potentially justify retaining a, a small force of Vulcans in service and upgrading them so they could carry perhaps cru uh, cruise missiles or precision weapons? Um, the Vulcan was trialed with um, paveway laser guided bombs during the conflict for potential future use, including potentially against the mainland. Although the report, the report of the planning for that said that no suitable targets have been identified, the subtext being that they're jolly expensive bombs. And if we're going to bomb some um, airfield in Argentina, if Mrs. Thatcher decides that's necessary, um, then we really want them to be, we, we really want the cost um, of the bombs to um, somehow match the target that we strike. Um, but there was no funding for it. And the reason for that was because of the cost of bringing the tornado, particularly tornado um, GR1, as it then was into service. And the money simply isn't there isn't there to do that. So the Air Force's focus turns fairly promptly back to the Central Front. And it's interesting if you look at the Central Trials and Tactics organizations um, work in this, and I know, I don't know if it's still on the call, I know John Shields has obviously um, looked at this as well, but some of the lessons that come out are quite interesting. And it's almost like some of them can't be funded and some of them are. The one notable, or perhaps two notable things I'd pick up of first of all that black buck is held to demonstrate the importance and the validity of purchasing the jp233 anti-runway system um, because of the difficulties in striking a runway using unguided ordnance if it's not a specialized anti-runway kit um, and of course the americans had been involved in jp233 but at some point somebody senior had looked at the operating uh, or the profile for delivering the weapon and it effectively turned around and said it's suicidal um, we should spend the money on something cheaper and on standoff systems and the royal air force goes ahead and of course jp233 is used in 1991 and contrary to a number of the myths only one of the jp233 aircraft is actually lost uh, in combat the others that are lost are carrying um, apart from the final loss they're carrying um thousand pound bombs uh, JP233 that was uh, carrying aircraft that was lost probably um, hit the ground as it was evading an incoming threat as well. So that's the first one. The other aspect is that flying at low level or ultra low level is seen to be perhaps the only way of defending yourself against um, incoming enemy ground fire. And although the Harrier GF3 force, a lot of aircraft take um, superficial damage, they do lose a number of aircraft, of course, um, squadron leader Jerry Pook has to eject his aircraft, sustains what is superficial damage, and fortunately, it's superficial damage um, over a fuel tank, and he runs out of fuel and has to, ha has to punch out. Um, so the, the Air Force learns lessons that suggest that JP233 and ultra low level are the way forward. But of course, they're thinking about this in the context of operating in Central Europe. And this is why I think some of the issues relating to Nimrod and the air transport force, it's worth exploring those. And also looking at some of the lessons that we don't really seem to identify relating to the use of fleet air on helicopters. Because let's not forget the commander helicopter force had World War III broken out. So a lot of its commitment would have been to support um, operations in Norway. Um, well, what did we did the Falklands validate lessons or, or ideas? Did he produce new lessons learned, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um, we don't seem to see that, and there is this element of taking for granted the maritime and the um, uh, and air transport, uh, maritime patrol and air transport forces as well. That is, is um, not something that occurs in the Royal Air Force, but of course, they, it's something that's happened, and then the Air Force goes back to it, to its routine, preparing to fight the Third World War. But in a way, the Air Force is used to doing a lot of sort of short notice deployments using aircraft. So in a way, the Falklands doesn't come as a nasty surprise at one level, because this is the sort of thing they've done. Um, it doesn't come as a surprise to the Royal Navy, of course. It, it might come as a surprise to those who turn around to the Royal Navy's obsolete for anything other than operations in the North Atlantic, um, as previous speakers have outlined more eloquently than I have. Um, but I think it does, you know, it, it does 
works slightly differently for the Air Force in that it's a, in terms of direct combat, it's um, relatively you know, relatively limited. And I'll I'll put in as well John um, John Shields' point where he said the the RAF position post not review um, was looking pretty rosy. Tornado um, coming into service, Jaguar extended, Harrier GR5 funded, plus additional tankers and the additional um, F4 Phantoms that were brought into service for UK air defence. And um, the point I would make is return to normal operations to the RAF post conflict. Um, and I think it's a very, you know, I think it's a very interesting set of experiences as well, where for the Air Force, we should remember that again, in terms of casualties, the Royal Air Force's one fatality is a Royal Air Force Regiment Officer, Flight and Garth Hawkins, who's a forward air controller with 22 SAS, uh, and who is lost in the uh, crash of the helicopter when it's cross decking along, uh, along with the SAS teams that he's supporting. Um, so the war is somewhat the war is somewhat different, I think, and the lessons are more a okay, case so of does this does this kind of show us that what we're doing is generally right, and arguably it does. The only problem is, of course, the air force. The next time it goes to war, it goes to war in in a desert um, in 1991. So it's a very it, it show it shows the the challenges of the unexpected and being prepared to meet the unexpected as best you can. I think that would be my answer, so slightly long-winded. Yeah, it, it, it certainly appears that where the Navy and the Army got a lot more out of 1982 than the Air Force perhaps did, but then the Air Force was faced with the Middle East in broad terms, Afghanistan, which it seems to have been, you know, more reflective on because obviously the amount that it was involved in, um, the flip side of that, we almost see there are naval personnel and marines involved in afghanistan but they've almost got completely forgotten and that hasn't been their experience have not been reflected on mm. versus of course the army and the, the air force are reflecting on the middle east quite a bit and i suspect there is now a debate saying well how much are they going to reflect on the middle east because things are, are looking at somewhere else now so it's very interesting topic you know, and I, I know i said earlier i'm wary of the term lessons learned um but it is very interesting to see how these organizations and how they remember things and how that impacts their thinking. We can always say those old, those arguments which resulted in 1981, the aircraft carriers, the shock of the Falklands, that was very much the same, the same product because there was analysis of the Second World War, which air forces came out of that in a very, in a light which was, this was the future. Uh, and, I, and as I've always said in my own research, na navies look absolutely obsolete in 1946, where air forces, if you're a young person, you're seeing battleships taken away, yet you're seeing nice shiny aircraft flying. There's no comparison there, is there really in sort of thing? So there's a trend here in the military, isn't there, of, of this kind of lessons learned and what we learn from something. How do you identify the threat and how do you address it? And I think there's, I think one of the things you highlight there potentially is this risk of people turning around and saying, oh, well, that service or that environment to use, or domain to use the contemporary terminology, it's obsolete. Uh, and this is something that I think any, and this hints particularly at Admiral Chris's point earlier, that is actually arguably more a case of, it may well be that the equipment that you are using has to evolve. It may well be the way you use it needs to evolve, but to turn around and effectively say, well, you know, navies are obsolete. Um, that, that, that infamous line in Sands, Sands era where he talks about the role of the Navy in future war is unclear. Well, yes and no. And I think there's a, there's a tendency in all three um, environments to potentially turn around and say, well, we don't need to think about that now. We're seeing, we're seeing that debate take place with relationship to armour. Well, actually, does the British Army need to have as many main battle tanks as, say, the Ukrainians, the Poles, Germany, for example? Does the Air, what, does the Air Force need to um, invest more heavily in expression of enemy air defences capability, or should we be spending more on transport aircraft? And then turning around and saying, well, is a navy, what, what about navies? Well, you only need to see the Black Sea uh, and, um, and the, uh, the fact that the Russian Navy is now missing the Moskva to say, well, actually, these environments don't become obsolete. It's the way in which they um, are used and the way in which they factor into the way the war is fought. And I think that's something we should probably learn from the Falklands, if you again took that learning. But it, it worries me that sometimes maybe we don't think about it in that way. Okay, um, well, thank you. Um, I don't think any additional um, 
Oh, I do apologise, sorry. Um, Alan Johnson comes in and says, um, you know, did we not learn from US carrier ops in the Pacific covering large areas of ocean supporting amphibious operations? Um, I think I'm probably not quite as well qualified to answer that question as James is, and certainly not as well qualified as our, our naval officers. Um, I would just say on that point that I think um, one of the challenges that has, has existed in terms of amphibious operations is that the Pacific does, does factor into our thinking, but the sheer scale of it, as so often, there's almost that we will never do this. Because remember, one of the things, um, not related to the Pacific, forgive me, but one of the things in 1966 that's used to justify cancellation of CVA-01 um, is that, in, in essence, the justification that is presented is that the only sort of operation that we would ever need a carrier for is something that, uh, and they then goes on to describe effectively Operation Corporate. Uh, but we're never going to do that, so we don't need a carrier. And I think that's, um, that's another one. And the, the question about the RAF moved to Australia has just popped up. As I say, the, the evidence in the files is very, very thin. Um, I'm being polite there. The number of historians have looked for that evidence but haven't found it. It almost seems to be a bit of a, a bit of an urban myth. I think it's originated, as I, as I alluded to, from, this, from the typo in the Chief Scientific Advisor's report or one of his staff, which misplaces Australia and puts it in a completely different ocean to the one it's really in. Um, in that draft report. I know um, Sir Michael Quinlan said that there was a mistake on a, on a map, um, but I've not, I don't know if anyone who's seen that map, and it's also a case that the, the mistake is pointed out at the time. So I think the, I, I think again, the, the risk is that we, we focus on, um, and forgive me, Alan, this isn't, a, this isn't a comment on your question, but I think it, it's actually an excellent point for me to, for me to sort of wind up really is that there is a risk of focusing not on the output, um, again, forgive jargon, but not on what could be achieved by putting all three services together in appropriate proportions um, for the campaign that's being fought. But the risk is that people lose sight of the purpose of the services, namely to fight wars again on behalf of the nation, to defend the nation, the nation's security interests, and instead, they start to, um, understandably, in peacetime, to focus on budget and end up fighting one another. Uh, and that is, is fundamentally dangerous. And the fact that, um, the, our, particularly our veterans here represented, were able to rise above all of that from the 1960s is, I think, testament to their achievement. But um, I don't think there are any more questions. So I'll conclude this part of the panel by saying thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much to Professor Helen Parr for um, joining us today and for her fascinating.